Well, folks, in, <clears throat> in reality, there are only three things that, that I can give away. I can give away my time, my talent, and my treasure. Uh, beyond, you know, think about it. Beyond that, there's really nothing else. And practical worship is tied to those three things. I call them the big T's, time, talent, and treasure. You have uh, just stepped into a worship service, and worship services are designed to inspire worship. And worship occurs in the heart of a man, a woman, when they are confronted with the great truths about God in the Bible, and they are inspired at that point to give up all that they have and all that they are to God. That is to say, they're, they're moved to give back to God their time, their talent, and their treasure. Um, this morning, we're going to deal with a passage that really impacts the stewardship of my time, talent, and treasure. In other words, it will prompt, I think, every one of us to ask, where am I investing my time, my talent, and my treasure? I was thinking the other day about the gospel, uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. And I thought, how, how incredibly wonderful is the gospel. In it, there's everything that I need, but if, if, if we really understand it in reality, the gospel contains everything that I would ever want. Forgiveness of all of my sins, the hope of heaven uh, when I die, and, and the power, the power to live a new life, a different kind of life right here and now. And, and you know, as I, I, I was thinking about the gospel, uh, not only are the, the gifts of the gospel wonderful, but it's also wonderful that those things that I just mentioned cost me nothing. They, they don't cost me a thing. Uh, they are free. But we know from the Word of God they're not cheap. Uh, they, they cost God everything. Uh, it cost God everything to give us this good news of the gospel. God had to give in order for me to get. In order for me to get something, God had to give something. And God gave what was absolutely most precious to him. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I, I am overwhelmed by the fact that God had to sacrifice that which was most precious to him, his own dear, darling, beloved son, so that he could give me the wealth of the gospel. And the gospel really is grace, isn't it? G-R-A-C-E. God, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus literally took my hell upon himself so that I could have his heaven. I, I write a word in my, my journal every day. I write the word grace and then this sentence after it. I, I write this sentence, I am doing today better than I deserve. I'm doing better than I deserve because Jesus took what I deserve on the cross and he gave me what I don't deserve, his heaven. And you know, as, as I thought about all of this, in the light of this amazing grace, cost me nothing, cost him everything. Uh, how am I going to feel one day when I stand before Jesus Christ and see him face to face? As surely I will, according to the scriptures. Look at the word of God. Romans chapter 14, verse 10 says, we all will stand before the judgment seat of God. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one will be recompensed for his deeds done in the body, in this body, according to what he's done, whether good or bad. One day, we are going to stand before Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this morning, do you believe that? You are. There's no one who will be excluded. Every single man, woman, boy, or girl will stand individually, face-to-face -face, with Jesus Christ, this incredible person. And remember who he is. He's the one who will wear scars in his hands as emblems of his love for me. 
And, and I guess my question is, what will I be thinking in that moment when I stand before this precious one who would rather go to hell for me than live in heaven without me? What will I feel in that moment? And specifically, what am I going to think about what I did with my time, my talent, and my treasure? I'm pretty sure that when I'm standing before Jesus, I'm not going to say something like this, why, why did I give so much of my time uh, doing his deal? You know, why, why didn't I use more of my talent for, for my purposes? Why, why did I invest so much of my treasure to advance his kingdom? I don't think I'll say that, no. I think I, think I will say, why did I not invest more of my time, my talent, my treasure to this one to advance his purposes. I, I think that I will be, be thinking in that moment, why did I not do more to please him? More than at any other time when I stand before him, I will, I will hope that my life, that the life that I am living right now will, will matter for his glory and not my own. And so, really, the big question for all of us this morning is, how can I live a life now that will matter then in that moment? I mean, I, I don't want a, my life to be filled up with stuff that won't matter then. I made a million dollars. I made $10 million. Big deal. It's not going to matter. Uh, I, 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 I was the salesman of the year. Doesn't matter. I have a big house and a big car and a boat, and it will not matter. Because you know what the scripture says? First Timothy 6, 7, we brought nothing into this world. We're not taking anything out, folks. Job, Job 1, 21, naked I came in, naked I'm going to return. I really took some great vacations. It's not going to matter. What, what is it that Jesus, listen, wants me to give my life to now so that he will be pleased then? That's the question. And before we discuss the answer to that question, I want to say to you that finding and living the answer to that question is the secret to joy, in e not only in eternity, but it is the secret to joy right now in time. What does Jesus want us to be doing right now? Folks, it's no secret. And uh, we saw last week in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, uh, and we're going to see it primarily today in the Gospel of Mark, uh, there's a real clue about what he wants us to be doing. Look at Mark chapter 1, 14 through 20. G it says this, Now after John, this is John the Baptist, had been taken into custody, Jesus came preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And as he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And then going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who, were also, who was also in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. Now, folks, at this point, Jesus had just burst on the public scene. He was baptized by John the Baptist. He was led into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, tempted of Satan. And then he begins his ministry of preaching the gospel, offering those things, the forgiveness of sins, heaven when you die, and the power to live a different life. He began preaching the gospel, and then the very next thing he does is he calls four fishermen to follow him. And these four men, uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John, had already been familiar with Jesus. Jesus was familiar with them. And he, he says to them, follow, you, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Now, here, here's the question, folks. Why didn't Jesus just save us 
and take us to heaven to be with him right now. We, we are, why are we as a church still here on this planet? And the answer is this, that Jesus wants to make us and transform us to become fishers of men. He wants every single one of us involved in the most exciting venture that's taking place on planet Earth, and that is fishing for men. Uh, I introduced this idea last week when we discussed the great fishing story of Luke chapter 5. And uh, Jesus, what Jesus does here with these fishermen, he sets up this great analogy, this great metaphor of what he wants us to be giving our lives to in the call of these fishermen right at the beginning of his ministry. It, it, it took his disciples a while to get it, to really understand it. Uh, but right here in this statement, he tells them exactly what he wants them to become, what he wants them to do, and, and really how he expects them to do it. He, he wants them to become catchers of men. And in order to do that, uh, he wants them to, to, to become fishers of men in the exact same way that they had become fishers of fish. He gives them great insight concerning how the process of catching men is to occur. If you're a Christian right now, I guarantee you he wants to make you become a fisher of men. He, and he wants you to catch men in the exact same way that these fishermen caught their fish. Do you understand that? That's, that's, that's the principle. Uh, I promised you last Sunday that we would consider the question, how do I become a fisher of men? How do we catch men? Well, if you, if you want to know meaning and purpose in life and experience joy in your life, to move out of boredom, then become a fisher of men. And I want to show you a number of things about becoming a fisher of men this morning. And the first I'm just calling the insight. Uh, if I'm to become a fisher of men, I, I, I have to know how a man is caught, right? <laughs> um, Consider for a moment fish. Where, where do fish live? I mean, this is really not too deep. Uh, fish live in the water. Uh, they live in an environment that's entirely different than ours. Uh, we learned last week uh, that there was another day, this other day in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus caught up with his disciples again and clarified and amplified his call to these men to become fishers of men. And on that particular day, in Luke chapter 5, they had been out all night long seeking to catch fish, and they came back with a big goose egg. They had caught nothing. So when is a fish caught? Uh, we're going to see it here. Uh, a fish is caught, according to this story, when it is captured by a net in the water, brought out of the water, and into the boat, into the air of the boat. Notice what Luke says uh, in Jesus' word to these men. In Luke chapter 5, 4 through 7, it says, When he, Jesus, had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out in the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, uh, we worked hard all night and, and we caught nothing. But because of your instruction, uh, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners to come uh, in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. Now, we learn here how to catch a fish. <laughs> um, you catch a fish by changing the environment in which he lives. And uh, it's inter interesting thing about a fish, when, when you bring a fish out of his old environment of the water and put him into the new environment of the air, uh, the fish dies, right? Um, think with me for a minute. What, what happens, let's, let's just say we put a man in the fish's environment of water, and, and, and he, let's say the man doesn't come out of the water. You know, we baptize people here, right down here. We ba what if I baptize someone and just kept them under, 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 under. What would happen? They die. Be, because uh, 
yeah, let me ask you a question. How long do you think it's possible for a man to hold his breath? How many people think a man could hold his breath underwater? I'm talking about underwater here for two minutes. Raise your hand if you think a man could do that. I, th I think a man could. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. How, how many people think a man could hold his breath underwater for five minutes? Okay. We've got a few believers out there. How many think a man could hold his breath for 10 minutes? You know the world record for a man holding his breath? His name is Stig Severson. He held his breath underwater for 22 minutes. But guess what? If Stig stays underwater for 23 minutes, he dies. <laughs> We have been called by Jesus to catch men. And there's a sense in which the men we are called to catch are, are living underwater. And, and that's why it is so important, folks, that they are caught. If they're not caught, they'll die. You see, there, there's some big similarities between the fishing that Peter and Andrew and James and John were doing on the Sea of Galilee and the fishing that Jesus has now called them to do and called us to do. But there's one big difference. They, they had a different motive when they were fishing for fish. Uh, they were fishing for fish so that the fish would die. We're fishing for men so that they might live. You see, the fish that we're trying to catch happen to be sinful men. They swim in an environment of sin and death. They swim in the world of the natural, the five senses, thinking that they're in control of their life, that they're on the throne of their life, living their life for their sake. The Bible says that men are spiritually dead, and their 23 minutes is ticking. And if they remain spiritually dead, separated from God, at the point of their physical death, they will be dead forever, eternally dead, in, in a place called hell. They swim in an ocean of sin and self-will. That's what sin is. Sin is me living my life, my way, for my sake. And in the end, they will die because Romans 6.23 says the wages, the payoff for a life of sin is what? It's death. And so to catch a man is to capture him in a net and bring him to the surface of a new environment in which his heart is captured by the will of another. When he's pulled by that net out of the environment of the five senses of only what he can see and smell and taste and touch and hear, and he breaks the surface into a new environment with a sixth sense of faith. And he's able to see for the first time the grace of the Lord Jesus, God's riches at Christ's expense. All of a sudden, he is ready at that point to surrender his will to the will of another, to the will of Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you this morning, in 1972, this 23-year-old was caught for Jesus Christ. And I surrendered my will, my life to him for his purposes. When a man's heart, mark it down, is captured by Jesus Christ, he is caught. Let me ask you this morning, have you ever been caught by Jesus Christ? Has your heart ever been captured by the Lord Jesus? Now listen. Listen. There was a, a, an instrument that they used for catching fish. It's called a net. And in the same way, there's an instrument for catching men. And let me show you what that net is, the instrument. Uh, the way a fish was caught on the Sea of Galilee was through the use of this net. It was cast into the sea, gathered up, gathering it together and capturing anything that swam inside. Men and women are caught in a similar fashion. They're caught when they swim into the net and their hearts become captured by the net.
And I, I don't think it's any accident that the two verses preceding the call of these fishermen in Mark chapter 1 explain to us, show us, reveal to us what the net is. It, it says in Mark 1, 14 and 15, now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came preaching. Here it comes, the gospel of God. The good news of God saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, get out of that water and believe the gospel. A man is caught in the net of the gospel. I, I was captured by the net of the gospel. When I heard of the offer of forgiveness of all of my sins, past, present, and future, that would have been enough. But the hope of heaven when I die, the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome things that were troubling my life, that were burdens in my life, when I heard of that offer and that it would cost me nothing because Jesus paid for everything, I, I was captured by the net of the gospel. Now, I want you to think with me concerning how this instrument of the net of the gospel is cast into the world to catch men. I think it's instructive as Jesus looked to these men. He called them away from their life of catching fish to a life of catching men, but in a very real sense, folks, hear me. He called them away from a fish-catching team to a man-catching team. You see, on the Sea of Galilee, mark this down, it took a team of men to catch the fish. It, it, it was a job that could not be accomplished by one man. Uh, it took Peter and Andrew and James and John and Zebedee and the hired servants to pull off a catch of fish. Some people had to row the boat. Some people, you know, uh, had to cast the net. So other people had to mend the net to make sure the net was ready to go. Others, you know, cl cleaned the fish when they caught them. It, it took a team to catch fish. Do you see that? And it takes a team to catch men. And Jesus' call is for us to follow him in order to become a member of a team to reach people with the net of the gospel. To become an effective fisher of men, I need to be a member of a team. And listen, God will use what you're good at to reach men for Jesus Christ. And, and I like to think that the net that catches men as being the gospel, but the gospel in this form, mark this down, the net that catches men is the gospel gripping the lives of men and women called the church. Mariner's Church is designed to be a net that is catching men, pulling men and women out of the sea of sinful living into the, the fresh air of grace, into the fresh air of faith and hope and love, pulling men and women out of darkness into light, out of death into life. That's, that's what we're about and we're a net to do that. The, the church is a, a collection of men and women who have already been caught by Jesus. Our hearts have been captured by Christ. And now we're knit together like one big net with different gifts and abilities to capture others with the good news of Christ. Becoming a fisher of men does not mean that we all do the same thing. But together... We, we are a powerful instrument in the hands of the Lord Jesus doing each one of us what we are uniquely gifted to do. There, there are some of you here this morning who have been caught in the net, which is Mariner's Church. You were captured by the gospel message, not only because you heard it here, because you saw its implications lived out in the lives of the people who come to this church and who minister to you. Perhaps you got caught by the gospel as you saw people uh, living it out in a small group. This church is a net. And I'll, and I'll tell you why we're a net that captures people. We're a net because there is in this, this church everything that men and women want and everything they, they ultimately need. There is faith here. There, there's hope in the future here. There's love, there, there, there's purity, there's power, there's a purpose for life. It's all here, and, and I see it in you. 
I, I, I love to see the faith, the hope, the love that you have for Jesus Christ and for one another. It's all here. And that's what catches people. If you have a heart uh, for the Lord Jesus, you need to be a part of this, this net this group of gospel grip people. Now, if, if the net which captures men is that group of people called the church, um, there's a couple of things that I think we need to understand is that there are differences in roles and there are similarities in responsibility. To have an effective fish-catching operation, there, there were differences in roles. I mean, one guy was casting the net, another guy was mending the net, another person was rowing the boat, another person was collecting and cleaning the fish, and so on and so forth. Uh, God wants you to be a member of a team to catch men and women for Jesus Christ so that they'll live and not die. And if your heart has been captured already by Jesus Christ, the scripture says that you have a talent. You have a ministry gift uh, to love people. Uh, through, through the use of your gift. 1 Peter 4, verse 10 says, each one of us, who, who, which each one? Those who've been captured by Jesus has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Every one of us has a talent, a gift for ministry. And, and the question is, are you investing your talent, your gift in this great man-catching enterprise? What will make us a stronger, more effective net for catching men and women for Jesus Christ here in Annapolis? The, the answer is more members in ministry. The, to, that is to say, we, we will be a stronger net when the unemployment rate of Christians at Mariner's Church goes down. We, we have, um, you say, we'll build... Uh, where can I minister here at Mariners? I, I tell you what, as you leave the worship center today, there is a table that you'll have to trip over that has uh, a ministry guide of all the different places where you can serve here at Mariners Church. Pick one up. Uh, we have a VBS coming up where we're approaching close to 100 uh, kids, ministering to 100 kids. We, we need more people to help out with that. There's so many different ways that you can serve here. Where are you investing your time and your talent for the glory of God? Now listen, there's different roles, but, but also we need to understand there's similarity and responsibility. We have a responsibility, every one of us, to pray for the men and women who are in the orbit of our life. We all have different orbits. And there are men and women in your life and my life that I know out there who are now living underwater. They're, they're, they're living in sin, living for their sake. They, they don't know Jesus yet. And it's our responsibility to pray for them. To, to even invite them to swim in this direction, to come to church so that they can hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus. If fishing for men involves having a heart for those who are lost in sin and dying, if fishing for men involves knowing my role on the team called the church, if fishing for men involves wooing men and women, inviting them to come to Jesus, how do I do it? Here comes number three, the instruction. He was going along the Sea of Galilee, Simon and Andrew, brother of Simon, casting their nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to him, here's the instruction, follow me. Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. The instruction for becoming a fisher of men is very simple. Jesus says, follow me. And I will make you become a fisher of men. The number one thing we need to become a fisher of men is to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. And when he moves, we follow. You say, well, Bill, how do we follow Jesus? We follow him the same way the disciples followed Jesus. Jesus was their leader, and when he said, hey, let's get up and let's go, they went and they followed him. How do we follow Jesus today? Well, he's got to speak to us, doesn't he? He's got to say, you know, we're going to get up and we're going to go. And how does he do that? He does that through his word. We've got to listen to the word of God and follow what he says. And if you will keep following Jesus miraculously, 
you will become, you will have a heart for men and you will become a fisher of men on a team. What is your responsibility? What is the one instruction? Follow Jesus. Is it, don't you love the simplicity of the Christian life? It ain't complicated, folks. It is follow Jesus Christ and he will produce everything in you that we need. You say, well, Bill, this all sounds really good. Why would, why would anyone not want to become a, a follower of Jesus and become a fisher of men? What, what is it that keeps anyone from becoming a fisher of men? Final thing, number four, uh, the issue. Let's see the issue. Uh, I want you to look at Mark 1, uh, 17 through 20 there. It says, and Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And I want you to notice carefully what this does not say. It does not say to them after Jesus called, does not say immediately they followed him. And then going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending their nets, and immediately he called them, and they went away to follow him. It doesn't say that. Here's what it says. Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately, underline this, they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending the nets, and immediately he called them, and they, underline this, left their father in the boat with the hired servants. And then they went away to follow. These disciples, listen, had to be willing to leave their nets, their father, their boat, in order to follow Jesus. They had to leave all those things that had been their livelihood, all those things that had been their security, their significance, their father who had been their mentor. They had to be willing to give it all up and leave everything that was previously precious to them in order to follow Jesus. To be a fisher of men, you must be willing, oh folks, hear me, to leave everything in order to follow Jesus. You will never become an effective fisher of men until you face the issue of saying goodbye to that which was your security and your significance in the past. Just as these fishermen faced an issue that could have kept them from following Jesus, so do you. And so I ask you this morning, what's your issue? What, what is it this morning that keeps you from throwing caution to the wind? And following Jesus Christ. What, what are the things that you are currently investing your time, your talent, your treasure in? Are you willing to leave those things in order to follow Jesus Christ? There are people here today who will probably not become fishers of men because there are nets that you're unwilling to leave. I talked to Mike Kozak about this last week. I think we all have nets, don't we, Mike, that we're, that are tough to leave. There are relationships that we're unwilling to break. Perhaps there is a financial security uh, that you're unwilling to leave. And, and maybe, you know, maybe your net is the net of financial control. And, and may I, I just speak plainly right now? Uh, on your bulletin, uh, there's uh, an indicator of where we are financially in our church. And for the first six months that just ended on 30 June, our uh, expenses have exceeded our income. Um, it takes money to keep a fishing boat in operation. Uh, there are nets and things you use to catch the fish. There's the boat. Uh, there's the men to row, the men to work, and, and folks, a church is no different. It takes money to keep our ministry effective and running, and one of the ways that we can be a more effective team is to have a healthier general fund to resource our ministry. Um, 
there are some things that we have planned for our future that we will not be able to do unless we catch more fish and our financial health improves. If, if everyone who attends Mariner's Church would tithe and give the first tenth of their income as the Bible teaches, there would be no holding back of this church in ministry. Ma Malachi chapter 3 uh, verse 10 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, declares the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. To, to, folks, listen to me. To follow Jesus means to be faithful in the matter of giving. When a person comes to Jesus Christ, uh, ceases to be an owner. We become stewards. You yield all that you have and all that you are to Jesus. We are stewards of what belongs to God. And why does, it, why does God prescribe the tithe? Why does he say give one-tenth off the top? He, he does it in order to show us where our heart is. Matthew 6.21 says, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The Lord has given us the tithe as a regular check on our hearts to remind us that he is number one and that everything that we have belongs to the Lord. And so I give the first tenth of, of my, my money to the Lord and, and as a reminder, and I say to myself, Lord, it's all yours. And thank you for this reminder and thank you for the provision of the rest of it to meet my needs. Could it be that some here this morning really are not fishers of men because you haven't followed the Lord in the matter of giving, not willing to leave the net of control of my money for my sake. People who have no heart for the lost, I can tell you, are not making an investment of their treasure into the cause of Christ, into catching men. Let me give you something just to consider as we close things up this morning. Um, if you want your life to matter in eternity, become a fisher of men now. Become a member of a man-catching team called the church. Let me give you three practical words of application. They're not on your outline. You can jot them down. The word seek, the word support, the word serve. Seek support, and serve. Here, here's the first thing. Seek to be a vital member of a man-catching team here at Mariners. And folks, uh, let me tell you what you can do practically to begin to move in that direction. On, on the news section of your bulletin, there is a save the date. We're having a membership gathering on Saturday morning, September the 16th for all current members of our church and those who want to be members of our church in order to explain in greater detail what it means to be a member of this man-catching team and why it is so important to be a member of a local church. Mark your calendar for that. Seek to become a vital member of this man-catching team. Number two, uh, support the ministry of Mariner's Church uh, with your... Investing your treasure, your tithe. And number three, serve on our team. Starting today, right now, as you leave today, uh, and just pick up a ministry guide. See where you can serve. Vacation Bible school. You know, maybe that's, that's the place. Here's the message this morning. It's real simple. I could have saved you a lot of time and just said this. Follow Jesus. Don't say amen. No, you can say amen to that. But to do that, you must be willing to leave your nets. Um, yeah, we got a phone going off over there. There we go. Okay. That could have been, I think that is the Lord Jesus calling. <laughs> He's calling all of us. Amen. The message folks, is follow Jesus, but to do that, 
you have to be willing to leave your nets. And they, those nets come in all shapes and all sizes. The nets are those things which keep us from following Jesus. And your nets may be the financial net of trying to control your own, your money. Uh, maybe, maybe your net, listen to me, is an unholy relationship. Maybe it is a hobby, a sport, or a possession that has become an obsession to you. Maybe, maybe it's an unholy practice like pornography. Maybe it's a love for someone else that exceeds your love for Christ. It could be, a net could be your family. You may have a Zebedee in your life that you're unwilling to leave. I'd like you now, if you would, please, everyone bow your heads, shut your eyes, every head bowed, every eye closed. And I, I want you to answer this question. And you're, only you and only the Lord know the answer. And here's the question. What, what are the nets in my life? What might be the things in my life that I am unwilling to leave in order to follow Jesus? Where, where is the place that I'm investing my time, my talent, my treasure? Is it, is it somewhere other than Jesus? What, what are your nets? Think about it now. Is it your job? Maybe it's your house. Maybe, maybe it's this, this area of financial control, some other relationship. Maybe your net is your dream for your future that is not really God's dream. What is it? What is holding you back from following Jesus unreservedly? I believe Jesus is calling today. And he's saying, Bill, follow me. Barbara, follow me. You put your name in there. Follow me, and I will make you become a fisher of men. And he's waiting for your answer. And here's the, here's the big question. Will you leave your nets? Will you leave your nets in order to follow Jesus? Lord Jesus, thank you. Oh, Lord, thank you for the gospel. Thank you that that there is available to every man, woman, boy, and girl in this, this room forgiveness of every sin that we've ever committed, past, present, and future. There is eternal life, the hope of heaven when we die. There is a power to live differently like Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Lord, that it's given to us by grace. It's free, but it's not cheap. Thank you, Lord. It cost you, Lord Jesus, suffering on a cross suffering an eternal hell for us. And I, I just have one prayer, Lord, that you would grant us, those who are here at Mariner's Church, that we would be so gripped by the gospel, so gripped by your love, that we would be willing to leave everything in order to follow you, that we would have no regrets on that day when we are coming to see you face to face. You're coming for us so that we would see you face to face. Lord, would you do it now for your glory? I pray in Jesus' precious, holy, loving name.